Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's FDU Alumni Webinar Series event, uh, Long-Term Care Planning, being brought to you by the FDU Alumni Association and the Office of Alumni Relations. I also want to thank uh, TD Bank for being our partner and uh, corporate sponsor for our Alumni Webinar Series this year. As always, we hope everyone with us this evening is doing well, and we thank you for taking your time out of your evening to join us tonight. I wanna take a moment to let everyone know some tips for making uh, tonight's webinar the best experience possible. Uh, tonight's event is being recorded. Uh, so if you're not comfortable in being recorded, this would be a good time to log off. Uh, the webinar will be shared online on our alumni webinar website um, in a few days. All participants on this webinar have been muted and we kindly ask you to stay muted throughout the night so as not to interrupt our speakers. Mm -hmm. At the end of tonight's webinar, we will have a short Q&A session. Some questions have been submitted prior and we will try to answer as many of those as we can. If you have any questions throughout, throughout the event, please submit them through the chat below and we'll try to get to them um, at the end of the event. At this time, I'd like to introduce our two speakers uh, for our conversation on long-term care planning. We're fortunate tonight to have two experienced attorneys from Skank, Price, Smith & King. First, we have Regina Spielberg, a partner at Skank Price Smith & King. She joined the firm in 2005 and currently co-chairs the Estate Gift and Charitable Planning Practice Group. Certified as an elder law attorney, Regina assists seniors, people with disabilities and their families on legal matters involving elder care, special needs planning and planning for incapacity. She focuses on promoting the best quality of life for the individual. She was also invited to join the Council of Advanced practitioners of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, a group of highly experienced elder law and special needs planning attorneys. We also have tonight Shirley Berger Whitenack, also a partner from Skank Price Smith & King. Shirley joined the firm in 1999 and is co-chair of the Elder Care of the Elder and Special Needs Law Practice Group and the Estates and Trust Litigation Practice Group at Skank Price Smith & King. Shirley is past president of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys a fellow and a member of the Academy Council of Advanced Practitioners. Shirley has also been an adjunct professor of law in the JD and LLM in elder law programs at Stetson University College of Law. Shirley and Regina, thank you for being with us tonight and I look forward to our great discussion. <clears throat> at this time, the screen is all yours. Thank you very much, Ken. So uh, I'm going to start and uh, Regina is going to be uh, working the slides, um, and then Regina will take over, and then I will take over. So we're going to kind of do mm. a tag team. And uh, I'm going to start by uh, telling you um, a little bit about what elder law is and what it is we do. So elder law is a practice of law that focuses on the needs of seniors. You know, most of the time when you're talking about uh, attorneys and their specialties. You're talking about an estate planning attorney who's going to be doing estate planning documents or a personal injury attorney who handles personal injury cases or a divorce attorney who handles divorce. Elder law really focuses on the population that we serve rather than the areas of practice because it's a holistic practice that covers various areas such as estate planning, long-term care, guardianships and government uh, benefits planning. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about estate planning um, and how it focuses um, on the elderly population. Regina will be talking about Medicaid planning and financing long-term care. And then I'm gonna be talking uh, later on about what happens if people didn't put the documents in place um, that they should have had to take care of themselves in the event of incapacity. And as Ken said, we'll try to answer as many questions uh, that we can for you. Um, one other thing I should tell you about elder law is that many of us also do special needs planning because the government benefits that are available to certain people who are elderly also um, are available to people with special needs. So not all elder law attorneys uh, engage in special needs planning, but many of us do. But today's program, we're gonna be primarily focusing on elder law and seniors. So 
Uh, let me start by talking about estate planning and the important documents that you should have. Um, and these documents, by the way, are important whether you're a senior or you're uh, much younger. Uh, people who are 18 and older who have assets should think about uh, creating a last will and testament. So a last will and testament is a document where essentially you are designating the beneficiaries of your estate, who will get your assets when you die. It appoints an executor of the estate. The executor is the person who is going to manage the assets of your estate and distribute them in accordance with the terms of the will after making sure that the debts of the estate are paid, taxes are paid, tax returns are prepared, et cetera. That's called the executor. And after the distribution of the assets, the executor's job is done. Also in your will, you can appoint a guardian for minor children or for adult incapacitated children. So if you have a child with special needs who needs a guardian because they're never going to be able to manage their own affairs, mm -hmm you can appoint a guardian in your will um, who is going to take over and care uh, for your child when you are gone. Also, if you have a will, you can, and most will say this, you can basically eliminate a bonding requirement. If you don't have a will and somebody is appointed as the administrator of your estate, the surrogates may require you to post a bond, which is really like an insurance premium to make sure that the administrator or the executor doesn't run off with the money um, instead of giving it to the beneficiary. So that's another advantage of having a last will and a testament. Um, so what happens if you don't have a will? Next slide, please. If you don't have a will or you don't have a, a trust that designates what's gonna happen to your assets, then the state laws of intestacy apply. So every state has laws of intestacy. Intestate is when you die without a will and that statute is going to designate who gets your assets when you die. And you may not be happy with that um, event. It may be perfectly fine if you have an intact um, relationship where you are married, for example, and both of you have children together. But if it's a blended family or you wanted to give assets to someone else other than, for example, your spouse or your children, you will have to um, have a will that designates where that goes to because what happens to your assets may not be where you actually wanted them to go. And by the way, that can um, result oftentimes in will contests uh, where people are fighting over the estate. So um, next slide, please. So the next, so we've talked about wills and I get this question a lot. I'm sure that Regina does too. Do I need a living trust? It depends. And one of the things that it really depends on is where you live. So in some states, probate is supervised by the court. It's very expensive process. The executor has to file inventories of the estate, has to file accountings, may not be able to distribute assets without permission of the court. And so in those states, it's very common to have a trust because by having a trust, you can actually avoid probate. What is probate? It is the submission of the will to the surrogate's office and the appointment of the executor. So if you live in a state that has onerous uh, probate, you may want to have a living trust to bypass um, probate. What does a living trust mean? It means that it is a trust that is created now not after you die in your will. Other reasons that you may want to have a living trust is perhaps you live in a state like New Jersey where probate 
frankly, is a piece of cake because we don't have supervised uh, probate here. Courts don't get involved unless there's a will contest. So probating a will and administering a will in New Jersey, in a state in New Jersey, is fairly simple. So we can't even tell people, we can't advertise to people that they should have a living trust in New Jersey because we as lawyers can be sanctioned by the Supreme Court of New Jersey for doing that. But sometimes there are good reasons, even in New Jersey, to have a living trust. Sometimes it's a question of having assets in other states. You want to put those assets like real property where the probate may be onerous into a trust. Let's say you own property in Florida or uh, another state where they have supervised probate. You can avoid having someone appointed in that state to take care of your real property if you put it in a trust. You also may want to have a trust to uh, manage assets if there is an issue that someone has been diagnosed with dementia or there's a history of dementia in your family. And of course, um, in some instances, you may want to have a living trust for a an individual who has special needs um, so that that person can continue to get government benefits or become eligible for government benefits that are means tested, which means they have asset or um, income limitations at another time. Next slide, please. So in discussing the issue of living trusts, you should understand that there are really two types of assets when we're talking about estate planning. There are probate assets and there are non-probate assets. Probate assets are assets that are governed by your last will and testament if you have one. And those are assets that typically are owned in an individual's name. Next slide, please. Non-probate assets, on the other hand, are assets that you, that you own jointly with someone else. So let's say there's a husband and a wife and they own the house together and they're both alive and one of the spouses dies. That is a non-probate asset because that house is going to, if it has right of survivorship or it's owned by a husband and wife, most likely it's going to be owned by the other spouse, the surviving spouse upon the death of the first spouse and it doesn't pass through your will. If there are joint bank accounts with right of survivorship, which most bank accounts are, that also typically is a non-probate asset. If there are beneficiary designations on your account that you own alone, payable on death, transfer on death, in trust for accounts, those assets will go to whoever the beneficiary is named on the account and generally will not pass through your will. However, when we are calculating estate taxes, we include non-probate wills in that calculation. So having joint tenancy or joint accounts or beneficiary designations is not necessarily going to avoid an estate tax if your estate is um, large enough to have that. Now, right now there's a federal estate tax of, with an exemption of $11.7 million. So most of us probably, you know, that are listening to this webinar uh, may not have sufficient assets. If you're married, husband and wife, you can have well over $23 million in your estate, but that is subject to change. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see what happens, you know, as time goes on. Uh, but you should generally have an understanding that titling your assets are very, very important when we do estate planning, because we want to make sure that your beneficiary designations, IRAs, 401ks, uh, whatever qualified retirement plans you have, life insurance are consistent with your estate planning. So um, now I would like to uh, move on to talking about a power of attorney. So we just finished talking about two types of documents that basically will allow you to determine who should get your assets when you die. 
um, a last will and testament and a living trust, which can manage the assets while you are still alive, but also manage the assets after you die. A general durable power of attorney is a document that can be of assistance to you while you are still alive, especially if you are unable to manage your own assets because you have uh, senile dementia or you have um, some other kind of illness that uh, does not allow you to be able to govern your assets anymore. So generally, a general durable power of attorney gives an agent authority over the finances um, of the person, the power, for example, to write checks or deposit money in a bank account or sell real property um, or go into a safe deposit box or change a beneficiary designation. In New Jersey, we can um, determine what kinds of powers the agent should have over your assets. In other states like New York, for example, there are forms that need to be used in order to accomplish um, this same goal. So the general durable power of attorney will look different from state to state. Now you may say, you know what? I know about general durable powers of attorney and I bet I can just download a form from the internet. And that may be true, but what you are downloading may or may not be sufficient for what it is that you want to um, accomplish. Next slide, please. There are two basic types of powers of attorney. There is a springing power of attorney and a limited power of attorney in addition to a general durable power of attorney. So what are these different powers of attorney? Well, a general durable power of attorney is a document that is effective upon signing. And that means that even if you're totally competent, if you gave that document to your agent, they could go to the bank and they can take money out of your bank account or write checks or do whatever it says in that power of attorney. And it survives your incapacity. So even if you are declared incapacitated, that agent still has the power to act. A springing power of attorney is a document that only is effective upon the triggering by certain conditions that are set forth in the power of attorney. So for example, you can have a springing power of attorney that says it's only effective if a doctor certifies that you are incapacitated. A limited power of attorney is a power of attorney that only lets the agent do certain things. So for example, you can have a power of attorney that says that it only allows you to sell a particular piece of real estate or it is only good for a certain period of time. Generally, Regina and I prepare general durable powers of attorney. We don't like springing powers of attorney. Why is that? Because if you're gonna have a document that says that it is only effective upon, for example, um, a doctor's note, it may not, or a doctor's certification, it may not be that easy for your agent to get such a document. The doctor may not want to give it to you. You may be incapacitated, but you may try to fight the agent from doing this. If you can't trust the person that you are um, appointing as an agent to take care of your assets while you are competent, you should not appoint that person to take care of your assets when you're incapacitated. So thinking about who you want to name as your agent under a power of attorney is very, very important. And later on, we'll talk about what happens if you do become incapacitated and you've never executed um, a power of attorney document. Next slide, please. So one of the things that you should know in New Jersey and in many other states as well is that an agent under a power of attorney cannot make gifts on, of your assets to other people unless the document expressly states that. Many people have 
powers of attorney that says my agent can do anything that I can do. That is not sufficient under New Jersey law and it's not sufficient under the laws of other states. And this is why you need to be very careful if you're going to be downloading a document from the internet because it may or may not include the powers that you need. Why would you want your agent to make gifts? Maybe you're charitably inclined and you donate every week to your church or your synagogue or your mosque. Maybe uh, you want to engage in Medicaid planning and Gina will be talking about that um, in a few minutes. Maybe you want to uh, reduce the size of your estate for um, tax purposes. So it's something to think about whether to give that power to make gifts to your agent. You also want to name successor agents because what if the person that you name dies? And you want to consider giving your agent the power to engage in Medicaid uh, and estate planning. And you may want to have that agent have the power to create and fund trusts. Next slide, please. So a healthcare proxy is really, it's known as an advanced directive for healthcare. It's really a medical power of attorney where you're designating someone to make healthcare decisions for you in the event that you are un unable to make medical decisions for yourself. And again, you would want to point um, successor agents if you do this. Now, unlike a power of attorney, a financial power of attorney in the state of New Jersey, a healthcare proxy is always a springing um, document. In other words, it does not come into effect unless the principal, the person who is signing that document, is unable to manage their own affairs. So if you have this document, you will continue to make medical decisions for yourself as long as you are capable of doing that. Next slide, please. So another document that you may want is a living will. Now, a living will is different than a last will and testament. That is the document where you give written instructions for what you wanna happen during the end stages of your life. So for example, you're in an irreversible coma and doctors have certified that there's no prospect of recovery or you're in a persistent vegetative state or you have uh, brain death. And under those circumstances, you can specify certain things. Next slide, please. You can decide whether extraordinary efforts should be made to keep you alive under those circumstances. Do you still want to have a ventilator or a respirator? Do you want to have a feeding tube? Do you want to have intravenous fluids if there is no prospect of recovery? You can have this document, Living Will, um, as part of your healthcare proxy or as a separate uh, document. Next slide. Your living will can direct whether you want to be an organ donor or whether you want to be alive if you happen to be pregnant under these circumstances. So you can say that you want the fetus, uh, you want your body to continue to be um, kept alive uh, until the fetus is viable, or you can state whether you want the pregnancy to be terminated. And you can also state whether you want to have all of these efforts turned off but you still want to be uh, comfortable and given pain medication. So at this juncture, I'm going to turn it over to Gina, who is going to be talking about planning for long-term care, and then I'll be back with you a little later on. Gina, you are on mute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry about that. Um, when clients consult me about long-term care costs and how to pay for it, they sometimes think that Medicare will pay for long-term care. So I wanna just point out what Medicare in fact will pay for. I think the reason that people think that Medicare will pay for some care or will pay for long-term care is because under Part A, Medicare will pay up to 100 days of skilled nursing care following a three-day hospital admission. 
days one through 20 are 100% covered. And there is a copay of $185.50 per day uh, for days 21 through 100. A couple of comments on this. Skilled nursing care means that you need physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, those types of therapies in order to um, recover from say a hip surgery or a stroke. If you have been hospitalized, admitted to the hospital um, for three days, Medicare will cover. It's really rehabilitative care. Um, if you have a supplemental Medicare policy, a Medigap policy, the Medigap policy may pick up some or all of the uh, days 21 through 100. I must say that very few of my clients, <clears throat> excuse me, get a full 100 days of Medicare because uh, the nursing home makes, first of all, this care is typically given in a nursing home. So I think that's why people think that uh, Medicare covers, but the nursing home usually determines at about day 20, 25, maybe 30, that the person is no longer responding to re rehabilitative care. Sometimes if the person is in such bad condition, they don't want to go to their physical therapy, they just refuse to take it. At that point, um, it's unfortunate, but the nursing homes contact the family and say, we're scheduling a discharge for your family member you know, they'll give you a date. Sometimes they only give you a couple of days to figure out what's going to happen to this person who's had a three-day hospital admission and has been recovering from some catastrophic event. That is not long-term care. Rehabilitative care is not long-term care. And Medicare does not pay for any long-term care. At the point where Medicare no longer covers the supplemental insurance also stops covering. <clears throat> and at that point, the family is told that you either can take your family member home or you can leave them in the facility. Um, in any case, as long as the person has assets, they are going to have to privately pay or have the family members provide care at home for whatever care that they need. The one government benefit that is available to pay for long-term care is Medicaid. Shirley used the term earlier, means-tested government benefits. Medicaid is a means-tested government benefit, meaning that it is not, unlike Medicare, it is not an entitlement. You have to qualify for Medicaid. So to qualify for Medicaid, you have to be, we call this the ABD Medicaid program. There are many Medicaid programs, but when we're talking about long-term care, we're talking about the age, blind, or disabled program, 65 years or older, or the person is blind, or they are disabled. And basically disability is defined by the social security definition of disability, which is that the person's in, uh, the, uh, unable to engage in any substantial gainful activity by reason of the medically determinable physical or mental impairment, which is expected to result in death or which has lasted or can be expected to last for a continuous period of a, not less than 12 months. In addition, you must be a US citizen or a resident alien and in New Jersey, you have to be a New Jersey resident. There is, by the way, <clears throat> no um, length of residency for this program. So you might sometimes hear for tax purposes, if you are a snowbird and you have a house in Florida for income tax purposes, you have to spend six months in a day in Florida. That's not the case with Medicaid. Somebody who is in need of care, somebody who's put into a nursing home, is a New Jersey resident for this Medicaid program immediately. And then you have to be determined to be medically in need of Medicaid. That requires Medicaid to send out a nurse to do an assessment to determine whether, whether the person applying for Medicaid needs regular daily assistance with at least three 
activities of daily living. So the activities of daily living are eating, bathing, dressing, <clears throat> transferring, meaning getting in and out of a bed or in and out of a chair and toileting. You must need regular assistance, daily assistance with at least three of those in order to medically qualify for Medicaid. People who are cognitively impaired and have to be supervised for medication, those are also considered when the nurse is doing the, the uh, assessment. Now the hard part is the financial eligibility. The person, the individual who's applying for Medicaid is only allowed to have $2,000 of countable resources in their name at the time that they are eligible for Medicaid. The, we'll get into what the spouse, a well spouse that's home or not applying for Medicaid can have. But if a couple, if both of the couple, both of the spouses need Medicaid, the spouses together, the couple can only have $3,000. So you can see this is truly a means tested benefit. There is an income cap for 2021, which is $2,382. So when we refer to income, we're talking about monthly income such as social security, or pension. We're talking about fixed income because obviously by the time you are down to $2,000 of countable uh, resources, you don't have investments that are generating any dividends or, or interest. And in New Jersey, IRAs count towards the $2,000. So you're not getting RMDs either. So the income cap is $2,382. Um, if you have income in excess of the income cap in New Jersey, you're not going to be able to pay for a nursing home or an assisted living with even $2,500 of income, and you would be over the income cap. So all that means is as long as your income is not adequate to pay for the cost of your care, and the cost of care of a nursing home in New Jersey is about $13,000 a month. Um, then you would have to have a qualified income trust. And uh, the whole source of income is put into the trust. And the income of the person applying for Medicaid is in general paid to the nursing home. There are some uh, exclusions for that, but generally the nursing home gets the income and that reduces the amount of money Medicaid pays for the care. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Medicaid treats a couple as a unit. So um, the community spouse is how Medicaid terms the spouse who's not applying for Medicaid. And Medicaid will look at all of the assets of the couple, his, hers, joint, his, his, joint, whatever it is, um, they deem half owned by one spouse and half owned by the other spouse. It doesn't matter how they're titled. It doesn't matter if it's her IRA, his 401k. Uh, I had a house, I went into the marriage with it. I have a prenuptial agreement. Medicaid doesn't care about any of that. They're going to deem half owned by each spouse. And the minimum that the community spouse will be allowed is that $26,000 amount. And the maximum that they're allowed is $130,380. You don't get the maximum unless half of the assets equal at least the maximum. So if, if the couple together has countable resources of $50,000, then the community spouse is gonna get that minimum amount, that 26,000 and change. And the uh, spouse that's applying for Medicaid is going to get the difference. And that will have to be spent down to $2,000. If the couple has $500,000, Medicaid will deem each, each spouse to have um, $250,000 and the community spouse will have to spend down to $130,380, which is the max. And the applicant for Medicaid will have to spend down to $2,000. The community spouse income base, there is a minimum of $2,155. Again, that's the monthly 
amount that the couple, that the uh, community spouse can have, should have. In many cases, they don't have that. There is often one spouse who has more fixed income than the other. If we had someone who was at home and not contributing to social security, in that case, they will probably, they will be deemed to be allowed to keep some of the income of the spouse who's on Medicaid. <clears throat> So what's an excludable resource? A house is excluded in New Jersey up to $906,000 of equity. If um, the house is occupied by the community spouse or a disabled or a minor child, then um, the house will remain excluded. If the house is only occupied by the Medicaid applicant who is not going to live there, but going to move to an assisted living facility or nursing home, Medicaid will require the house to be sold. $1,500 for a prepaid funeral or reasonable cost of an irrevocable funeral trust. There is no limit on prepaying a funeral as long as you make it irrevocable so that you can't get that money back. Most people are aware that the look back period for Medicaid is 60 months from the application date. And um, the reason for that is the caseworkers at Medicaid are going to look through 60 months of all of the bank statements, all of your brokerage statements, all of your IRA statements to see whether you've given away money. Uh, transactions, for the most part, it's transactions of $1,000 or more have to be explained. Some, some counties it's a little higher, some counties it's a little lower, but um, it, whatever Medicaid asks for with, by way of explanation of transactions, where did that $2,500 go? You have to provide it or they're just not going to find you eligible. They're looking for you to, to see whether you've given away money because if you have, and, or if you can't explain a transaction, they will simply deem that you've given away the money um, going back five years into a parent's assets and bank statements is not an easy thing to do. If that parent has dementia, you may not be able to explain all the transactions that were going on when they were beginning in the beginning stages of dementia. Medicaid assesses a penalty period um, for every gift or unexplained transaction that there is. So uncompensated transfers are gifts under uh, the Medicaid definition. And they are, the penalty is determined by dividing the average cost of nursing home care in New Jersey to calculate the number of months of, indiv uh, of months an individual will be ineligible for Medicaid. Currently, the divisor in New Jersey is $10,879 a month. So as an example, I used $100,000. If there are gifts or uncompensated transfers or unexplained transfers totaling over the five-year period $100,000, Medicaid will divide that by the divisor. And the answer to that 9.19 represents the number of months of ineligibility for Medicaid. The penalty period, the 9.19 is not going to start running until the person is otherwise eligible for Medicaid. So you've made a Medicaid application, you have these transfers, this penalty periods being assessed, you're in need of care because you've had your Medicaid nurse come out and do the assessment, you need care. Um, and you now have $2,000 in your name in order to pay for that care. Now you maybe have a 9.19 month penalty period and you're in a nursing home that costs $13,000 a month and you are not going to get Medicaid no matter what happens for 9.19 months. <clears throat> are there any exempt transfers? Yes, very, very, very few. We can list them on a single slide. Transfers to the community spouse are not penalized. But as we've seen, because the, uh, the couple is treated as a unit, transferring assets to the community spouse doesn't necessarily help you. The best uh, transfer to the community spouse is transferring the house to the community spouse. Uh, because there is, uh, Medicaid is required to um, recover when a person who's been getting Medicaid benefits dies if there's an estate 
So one of the assets that sometimes is still out there, having a personal, excuse me, on Medicaid is the house. And Medicaid will put a lien on the house if the community spouse is not the owner or is not living there. Transfers to a disabled child are exempt. Unfortunately, a lot of times, uh, if you have a child with disabilities, they themselves may be getting benefits. So we try to avoid direct transfers to a child with disabilities if it might compromise their, the child's uh, benefits. And we usually use trusts for those. You can also transfer the residence, not only to the spouse but to the, or to the disabled child. You can transfer it to a, a caregiver child, but the child has to have been, has to have for two years prior to the admission to the nursing home, providing care that has kept the person out of the nursing home. And you can also transfer a residence to a sibling with an equity interest in the house. So. Um, I've done very few of those, but I've had a couple where there've been two family homes and they're owned by siblings. One sibling lives upstairs, one lives downstairs, and we're able to transfer the house to the sibling who's not applying for Medicaid. Remember that when you make a transfer um, before death, you might result in some capital gains to the transferee. If you uh, transfer highly appreciated assets, I don't wanna to spend too much time on this because right now there have been several uh, pieces of legislation introduced in Congress that may change these rules. But as of today, if you uh, inherit something on the death of a person, you get a step up in basis, which minimizes capital gains taxes. <clears throat> okay. Um, I am, hang on, okay. We can do some planning with the house. We uh, will sometimes, if we're doing um, um, planning, um, say five year planning, we're doing planning so that the person can be eligible for Medicaid five years from now, because they have so, so many assets. Um, we may do a transfer of a uh, house to children, retaining a life estate to the um, person who's going to be applying for Medicaid because retaining a life estate will get a step up in basis and that will help with regard to the um, capital gains taxes. Um, the life estate owner receives any rental income and the calculation of the value of the life estate is based on actuarial tables this gets a portion of the value of the house out of the Medicaid applicant's name. So that is one good way that we handle house tra um, transferring houses. <clears throat> the uh, well spouse should execute the last, a last will and testament because if you have somebody who is in need of care, getting Medicaid, perhaps has dementia or other issues, you probably wanna set up a trust for them um, you should definitely look at um, the, the well spouse should look at the last will and testament, the power of attorney, all the documents Shirley was talking about, beneficiaries on life insurance policies need to be addressed because the person may not be able to inherit or get those assets. It will disqualify them from Medicaid. Um, and you don't want somebody who's in a nursing home to be serving as your financial power of attorney or even for um, your healthcare representative. Shirley's gonna talk about what happens if people don't do their estate planning documents. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about this very, very quickly because I know that some of you have questions about long-term care insurance or other questions and we do wanna give you um, an opportunity to do that. So I'm going to, um, truncate my remarks on this subject, but um, the issue becomes what if the person did not execute a power of attorney or a healthcare proxy and now is incapacitated, unable to do their own banking, unable to manage their affairs, unable to make medical decisions. So in many of these cases, we then need to look to court supervised surrogate decision-making, conservatorship or guardianship. And the next slide, please. 
And both of these are legal arrangements where a court will appoint somebody to serve as the guardian to make healthcare decisions, residential decisions, legal, medical, vocational, all different kinds of decisions. And so it's much better to have a situation where you are planning these documents ahead of time because going to court to have a guardian appointed or a conservator appointed requires the submission of numerous documents. And whereas a power of attorney may cost a few hundred dollars, going for guardianship will cost in all probability several thousand dollars. It's very, very expensive. And there's reporting requirements to the court. And so it really is a, um, a least rich, uh, a restrictive alternative to have a power of attorney and to have a healthcare proxy. This is the last resort that we wanna get into is having guardianships or conservatorships uh, appointed when you no longer have someone who can do that. In addition to that, when we're talking about guardianships, the person who is incapacitated doesn't get to choose who they want to serve necessarily. The court is gonna make that decision. And sometimes family members will fight over who should be the guardian. So we try to avoid that by uh, planning uh, these documents ahead of time. Um, if they're defective or if they don't work, uh, then we absolutely can talk about um, uh, doing a guardianship. A conservatorship is basically a supervised power of attorney where the person may go to court and say, listen, I need someone to manage my affairs. Uh, I know I'm starting to have cognitive issues, but I'd like the court to supervise them because I'm not sure that I entirely trust uh, this person. And so that's a voluntary uh, type of situation. It doesn't happen as often as guardianships do. So I'm going to end there. And uh, now I think we'll open it up for the next few minutes uh, with questions. Um, Kenneth, if you're still on and you want to read some of the questions, uh, you know, that, that would be fine. If not, uh, we can also do that. Yep. Great. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, Shirley. Um, I'm going to jump right into the question. And a couple of questions are related to long-term care insurance. Um, I guess uh, a couple of questions here. Um, are there any plans that cover more than three years of care? Most current plans seem skimpier than plans available years ago. Um, at what age should someone consider getting a long-term long care insurance? So long-term care insurance, uh, and I have it, and I know Shirley has it. So, um, you know, we're, we're proponents. Uh, long-term care insurance will help you to pay for the time when you have to privately pay for your care. So that point where I said Medicare stops paying, you need some care, and you don't qualify for Medicaid. You, if you have a long-term care insurance policy, you could engage in Medicaid planning. So the first question was, how long are the policies? You can get policies. I, I, I've seen policies for five years. A lot of times they're looking to cover um, the, the Medicaid look back period. Um, it really depends on how much money you're willing to spend. Um, so Shirley and I were talking about this question today. When I started practicing in this area more than 25 years ago, people used to get lifetime policies. They don't seem to write those anymore. Uh, we're happy when somebody has one who comes into the office. In other words, the benefit will continue as long as the person's alive. That's not what we get anymore. But yes, I think you can get policies that are longer than three years. Um, I, I'm not an insurance expert. I don't play one on TV. Um, but um, I know people who, who um, do these long-term care policy insurance people, and I've heard them speak and present to clients. There are so many different varieties, so many different um, things that go into it. So, you know, is there an inflation rider? Is it a, a compound inflation rider? How many years are you covering? Um, there are hybrid policies. One of the reasons that people have stayed away from these policies is because they are costly. You can't get around it if you're 
saying that you're paying $5,000, $6,000 a year for policy. It's a lot of money. But like I said, if you have a nursing home for $13,000 a month, $6,000 a year doesn't look so bad, but there's no guarantee you're gonna need a nursing home. Um, so it's possible that you could pay a lot of money for long-term care insurance and never use the policy. So they develop these hybrid policies where there is a death benefit for anything you don't use in the long-term care insurance uh, benefit. And that has been encouraging people to buy policies. They also, there've been some tax um, benefits to paying for long-term care insurance. Um, de the premiums are, are deductible and premiums, uh, benefits that are paid out are not necessarily taxable if they're being paid to family members. So um, generally I've heard insurance people say, by the time you're 60, you wanna have your plan in place because the rates tend to jump after age 60. Shirley, what do you think? <clears throat> yeah, so, um, you know, uh, I'll tell you a personal story. Uh, we generally tell our clients um, that in their 50s, they should think about getting long-term care insurance before they get sick and can't do it because that's the irony. Once you're diagnosed with dementia, you can't get long-term care insurance anymore. Once you have certain other illnesses, you're not eligible for long-term care insurance. So in my situation, my husband had a massive heart attack when he was in his 50s, and therefore he was not able to get long-term care insurance after that. So the younger you are when you get it, the less it's going to cost in premiums, although you may be paying for it over a longer period of time. Um, but it does make sense, at least in your 50s, uh, to explore it, if not um, earlier. Is there um, a question, Ken? Yep, similar to the right age um, for long-term care insurance plans, we had a question, um, the person is 27 years of age, and their question is, you know, could they in theory have all their information in terms of a long-term care plan set? And what do they have to do to make sure that if they ever were um, disabled or, you know, in a, unable to, make their own decisions. What are some of the things that they can do to make sure that their wishes are, are, are followed through? How, how can it be enforced? So the best thing to do is to have a power of attorney, healthcare proxy, living will, so that your decisions can be followed if you are incapacitated but still living, and a last will and testament if you are concerned about where your assets go after you die. And that's for anybody who's over the age of 18. It's not just for the elderly. Um, wills are good things for, and so are powers of attorney. We've done plenty of uh, powers of attorney and healthcare proxies for college age students um, and, and older uh, people with young children. But you have to remember at the age of 27, your life is going to change. Perhaps you're not married yet, but you're going to have um, a family later on and you're gonna wanna change who your beneficiaries are because instead of leaving it, to your parents or your siblings, you're gonna to wanna to leave it to your spouse or your children. So I generally tell people, look at your estate planning documents every three to five years, make sure that the plan is consistent with what's going on in your life. And if you're having major lifestyle changes like marriage, like divorce, it's time to look at your wills. It's time to look at your documents and see what changes you wanna make. Gina? Yeah, so, so Shirley talked about the powers of attorney and the powers that you give to your agent. These are very, very powerful documents. And giving your agent the power to do all of the things that would need to be done if you became disabled is critical. Uh, and, and especially engaging in Medicare plan, Medicaid planning. Um, but as Shirley said earlier, if somebody becomes disabled um, prior to age 65, we do a lot of planning for people with special needs. Well, we also do a lot of planning for people who are under 65 and some have some kind of traumatic injury. Um, people who are under 65 can transfer assets to a special needs trust and qualify immediately for Medicaid. Uh, the, the hook is that Medicaid gets repaid with whatever is left in the trust on the person's debt. 
So Shirley's right, get your documents in place. If something horrible happens, there, there, are, some, um, there are some resources available that are not available for the elderly and senior clients. So I see that there is a question about whether there's additional benefits for care for veterans, and there are. Um, it depends on whether you're, it's a service-connected disability. Uh, it used to be somewhat easy to do planning for veterans' benefits. It's much more difficult now. They change the rules for that. There are three state-run veterans' homes in New Jersey. One is in Paramus, one is in Island, and one is in Vineland where the cost of care is significantly less than private pay. Uh, so uh, a person who is a veteran uh, should certainly consult with an elder law attorney to determine whether there are any specific uh, benefits for veterans that may be available. There are federal vet veterans benefits also, and uh, the VA has a very, very good website. You can... Um, you can look on their website for things like aid and attendance, which is a cash benefit. There is a federal um, veterans nursing home. Um, where is that, Shirley? Lions, my, my father. Lions, there. Lions right. And Lions. So um, yes, there are there are veteran benefits. There's there's even a cash benefit for the survivor surviving spouse of a veteran. Um, if they are in need of care. And spouses can even get into uh, some of these veteran, state-run veterans nursing homes. It's a little longer of a waiting list because right. veterans have uh, There's a priority, priority. but right. spouses can also uh, get in there and pay a little more. Um, we have uh, time for two, hopefully two quick questions. Um, first question, with no siblings, how or who do you choose as trustee for special needs trust? I may even go a little bit further and say, what if I don't trust you know, my siblings to make decisions or you know, oversee my assets? What are some suggestions in terms of how, to, how people can navigate this? Special needs trusts particularly are, are a little bit easier because there are some organizations as Shirley well knows um, that will be trustees of special needs trust. We have a lot of people come in and don't trust their family members. One of the things we do um, is to try to counsel people just because you, you have a sibling that doesn't make them the best trustee. Even if you do get along with them, they may not have the skills to be a trustee. They have to be able to invest the, the trust assets and, and, and know how to distribute them and get the taxes filed. Not everybody can be a good trustee, even if they're your best friend, your best sister, your whatever. Um, so Shirley, you wanna talk about Plan NJ? There's a, uh, a nonprofit organization in New Jersey that is uh, called Plan NJ, which stands for Planned Lifetime Assistance Network of New Jersey. It's been in existence for about um, 31 years or 32 years. They have a lot of money under management and they basically also have a social worker uh, on staff. They are very, very attuned um, and very connected. They have nothing to do with the government, but they mm -hmm. have a re good relationship with the Medicaid agency, social security and other agencies because they deal with them so much and they will take a much smaller amount um, of uh, assets into management than a bank does. They also charge less typically than, than, than a bank does. So for especially the smaller trusts, but they love to take larger trusts as well. There are banks such as PPAC Gladstone, Ocean First, TD Bank, Wells mm -hmm. Fargo, many banks um, that will serve as trustees of special needs trusts, but they will wanna see a lot more money um, under management. And the, the Ark of Berg and Passaic also serves as trustee of special needs trusts. And Regina um, and Shirley, thank you. Shirley, thank you for um, putting up your email addresses there because I know some folks were interested in getting in touch with you. Um, and so the last question actually um, was submitted online and it says, basically, can your firm serve as an advisory role to the executor of an estate during an estate administration? Uh, yes, we, we, we represent executors all the time. It's actually a very big piece of what we do. Um, we will be as involved as the client wants us to be. 
We can, um, you know, help them through the probate process, um, sending up a notice of, of probate right through making the distributions and everything in between. We absolutely will do that. Great. And um, it's 8.01. So I just wanted to thank you, Regina and Shirley, for taking time out um, and speaking to all of us tonight. Thank, um, you. thank you to everybody online for submitting your questions um, and, you know, for, for being with us. Hopefully you found this webinar informative and very helpful. If you do have any other questions, um, Shirley has the email addresses for Shirley and Regina in the chat window there. Um, I just wanna remind everyone that our next alumni webinar is scheduled for Tuesday, May 25th. The topic is gonna to be credit awareness and identity protection. We'll have Brigitte Richter Hajduk, uh, VP of TD Bank uh, presenting with us that night. Um, and I do also wanna thank TD Bank for being a partner and sponsor for our webinar series this year. Um, and with that, um, I look forward to seeing everybody online in a few weeks. Until then, please take care, stay healthy, and be well. Have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you.